Hello, everybody. And how's everybody doing? Fantastic. Um, I have a um, horrible case of bedhead that I just can't seem to um, get taken care of here. There's no medicine over the counter for bedhead. And I haven't been in bed in hours. And I still have it. So um, it's, it's pretty sad. And if anyone can even tell, I'm wearing a Breathe Right strip on my nose because apparently I've been breathing wrong this whole time. So hopefully that's something that cures itself. Jeez. Um, yeah, and as you can see, I, I am displaying some of my art pieces. Um, yeah, and if you're on, if if you follow me on Instagram, you'll be seeing these things as I put them up. I was doing a lot of acrylics, but we don't need to talk about that right now. We're here for other stuff. So I'm gonna give you quick updates, and then we're gonna get into some stuff. So first off, um, oh yeah, first off, um, I have a gift for you. Yes, you. Oh, and you over there, and even you. I have gifts for all of you. If you go over to my website right now, you'll be able to get a free ebook of my short stories and poems that um, I put out last year. So um, it's about 200 pages and it's free. It's gift wrapped with a nice little email bow for you. So um, that'll be something fun for everybody. Um, but honestly, I know the moment you've all been waiting for. Um, quit calling me about it already. I'm doing it now, jerks. Um, my phone's been ringing off the hook. And there are probably some people who are not old enough to know what the fuck a hook is for phones to ring off of. So that's something. Um, but yes, so the new chat book. The new monthly chapbook by yours truly, P.O. Box 3054 by me. And this right here, this is the lobby of the post office there in the middle of the desert. And if you look right here, that was my P.O. Box that I went and checked every day. Because when I lived out in the middle of the desert, I didn't get mail delivery. So I would have to drive 20 miles to this weird little tiny post office and um, this is poetry about my experiences in that post office. And um, I dedicated it to JT, who is this amazing woman who ran the place. And when she was there, all your shit was taken care of. Um, your mail was taken care of. Your packages coming in was taken care of. You always knew you were going to get your shit. But then on Saturdays or when she was on vacation... Dude, this place right here, line all the way down here, all the way around the corner. Nobody would get anything. It would be like uh, a crapshoot if you were going to get your stuff. And everyone in line would be going, Jesus Christ, when's JT getting back? Um, but this is also kind of interesting. If you ever picked up my uh, book, The End of Everything, because there are a couple poems in this book um, about that post office. And one of them in that book is called The Man and the Quitters. And in this book, we have Return of the Quitters. So um, it's kind of like a continuation of sorts. And then um, each one is signed and numbered. And um, there's only going to be 20 of these. So it's super limited run. And if you are um, in the $10 or above tier on my Patreon... Uh, that's probably already on its way to you. Um, and if you want to get in on that, you could just go over, I think it's patreon.com slash Matt wall. There'll be a link down below um, and get on that tier and you could get the free chat book every month and a bunch of other free goodies. Um, and I'm going to be doing more stuff with my art on Patreon for the free goodies as well. So that's cool. Um, second, Oh, and then you could just either that or get it on Etsy. Um, either way. Um, and again, just go to IHateMattWall.com to figure all this stuff out. Um, but I did want to announce something else. I'm going to be doing a um, read-along 
of Visions of Cody by Jack Kerouac, with Jason from Old Blues Chapter and Verse. And this just came today, and I just realized that a bunch of the pages on the bottom have been cut for some ridiculous reason. Oh, when it's not actually any of the... Oh, man, the type in this is small. And look at how Kerouac writes a paragraph. What a dick. Ugh. Okay, but anyway. Um, so this will be um, an, an interesting read because um, I don't know how... Me and Jason have talked a little bit about Kerouac, and um, I feel like we both have kind of a lukewarm response to him, so um, this will be an interesting thing, and um, we haven't really talked much about it other than we're doing it in February, um, so for those of you wondering when we're going to do it, that's when that's going to happen. So anyway, so there's that. I wanted to read to you an email I got. I had a question from someone whose name um, we went into some detail about, but that's a whole other story. And um, that was actually really interesting. Um, but it is from Matt Ripley, um, who's a subscriber on my YouTube channel. And he asked me a question that I thought you guys would really dig. And then I answered a completely different question to him. So now I'm gonna do a video on what he actually asked me. So um, the question was, um, I was wondering if you have any pulp specific advice regarding if and how you should incorporate powers or the supernatural. A pitfall I want to avoid is basically starting a nuclear arms race of sorts with superpowers or going full Hellboy. So that is a totally amazing question and good. Um, so I'm going to tell you my answer to this question. And then I'm also going to litter in the, or sprinkle in the answer that I gave him when I thought the question was worded a little bit different. But basically when one talks about writing pulp or like using pulp sensibilities, this is also very comic book. Like, so if you're writing comics or anything like this, the same thing holds true. But we all have the want, let's say. If you give your hero like amazing powers or um, abilities to contact the supernatural or whatever like that, or have the supernatural, the... the automatic response that someone would then go to is like, Oh, I need to take over the world. Now. Some of you guys are like, actually, I wasn't thinking that at all, but, um, that's kind of how these things go. And like, logically, if you made someone so powerful, no one could stop them. Who's to say they can't take over the world like that kind of stuff. And, if we're talking pulps, there's a lot of good examples on how to do this right. If we're talking comics, there's a lot of examples on how to almost do it right. There's definitely a ton of examples on how to do it wrong. But um, I would say, um, and probably some of you are screaming right now at the screen here, Superman. Okay? Superman, if he's super... Like, what the fuck, right? So, um, and I think a good, um, and I can't remember the name of it now. Oh, I think it's called Red Sun. When the idea was, what if um, Clark Kent, when he crashed on Earth, before he was Clark Kent, obviously, didn't land in America, but landed in Soviet Russia, like, how would the world be different? And it's really, really interesting, and it's a good read. Um, so definitely pick that up if you haven't yet. But um, the thing with Superman is that where he ended up in Smallville, just the name of the town and everything, like, it adds to how this works. If you take somebody, especially if they're a good guy, and you just beat into him like you can't use your powers for evil and you 
you bring them up in this very small, close knit rural community, um, and then have him experience the big city like anyone experiencing the big city for the first time would. The sensibilities of that character are still small town. So with that, it would be really hard to turn him into like the nuclear arms race. But then if you read the Red Sun book, um, which again is a very good read, and I'm and like some people are gonna get mad right now. I think Superman's awful. Like I don't I I don't like Superman. It's it seems like cliche after cliche, but then at the same time, he kind of wrote the book on cliches, so can we really blame him? So there's all that. Now, if we go um, into more of the pulp world, you had um, characters like the spider and characters like the shadow who dealt with um, small time fuckers and then some like heavy fuckers. Um, even with Doc Savage, like a lot of the Doc Savage stuff is people trying to take over the world or something. And Doc Savage and his crew's like, yeah, fuck you, buddy. I'm going to show you like how that's not going to happen and all this stuff. <clears throat> and I'm totally simplifying this right now. OK, but um, I'm trying to like kind of make a point here. As soon as there is a villain who is strong enough or powerful enough or has the financial capabilities to take over the world. You need to ground that character into a reality. And um, the other thing that this does <clears throat> is kind of humanizes the character, which if you're doing more long form storytelling will really help you out long term here. If you're just writing a one off and it's short, especially if it's a comic book and like, you don't need to dig this much into the person's past because you only have 20 pages to do it in. But if this character somehow wants to take over the world, but then is like, oh, this person foiled me when I was trying to get those small plutonium rods out of that vault truck or something like that. Now this character, this villain, has like a bone to pick like who the fuck is this person who foiled my plans fuck that guy so that guy becomes the um thorn in the side of your villain so now the villain is going to want to destroy this person first and then take over the world and then if your good guy keeps foiling the villain it's going to make the villain more angry and more hell bent on revenge to where it's not a stretch to say, why is this guy like so concerned over this one dude that keeps fucking him over? Why doesn't he just take over the whole world and then come back and go after that one guy? That doesn't matter because once you put an obsession in the heart of someone who is a megalomaniac to begin with or a sociopath to begin with, it's completely rational and logical that this person would have a crazed obsession with this one person. And there are plenty of hero villain relationships that you could go down the list and go, Oh, not Batman, Joker, um, Superman, Lex Luthor, like the whole thing. And you could just go down the list, the spider and the fly uh huh. Um, we're digging there, but um, so the same kind of thing. Um, another thing is when you are reading pulps and you are reading um, comic books too, for that matter, you'll notice that there is a phrase that is said time and time and time again, which is like. Um, First, I will destroy Superman, then the world. You know, like this fucking thing. So it's like you're letting everyone, you're letting the readers know, you're letting everyone know that this character is fully capable of world domination, but the obsession to destroy this one thing is going to drive him way farther than anything ever could. 
So there's that. Now, as far as the supernatural goes, the one thing that's amazing about writing supernatural stuff is that for the most part, supernatural stuff is not proven. There is not enough factual evidence to back anything, which means that most people aren't going to be able to judge whether you're handling the supernatural stuff correctly. Um, and so that's just like something the writer would have to get over because I've done it too, where I'm writing something. I'm like, this isn't believable. Jesus Christ. Oh fuck. And then I write something else. I'm like, Oh God, is anyone going to buy this shit? Fuck. I I'm barely believing it. What the fuck? But when you're dealing with supernatural stuff, there is no, this is how you do it. This is how you don't do it because it is so like flim flam and there, there isn't any factual evidence enough to explain to someone this is how it should be done. This is how it should not be done. So as long as the characters in your book, especially if they're your protagonists, if your protagonists are like the reader, whether they're skeptics, whether they're um, experiencing something for the first time, they don't know how to handle it then that's fine because then the reader is living vicariously through your hero. And that's usually what pulp and comics um, and just action adventure stuff in general is supposed to do. You take an ordinary person and put, put them in an extraordinary situation. So when you do this, it makes the reader feel like they're a part of the team and if things happen to the protagonist and like, um, I don't know, like what's a really good example. I mean, there's millions. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm on the spider right now. I can't shake the spider, but like the spider chases some dude into a room and then the room starts to transform and gas starts coming out. And, um, these like, uh, spears start shooting through the walls at him. And then he goes into another room once he finally escapes and there's some, one there with giant silver eyes and it's really weird and spooky and all this other stuff. Um, at the end, it turns out to be like some Scooby-Doo thing, but um, at least to the reader at that moment, it was supernatural. It was weird. Like what the fuck's happening? Um, and that's another way to handle it. If you can Scooby-Doo your way out of every supernatural situation, um, then they weren't supernatural at all and you could explain everything away. But at the same time, if you lean on that as a crutch, people will start to believe that whenever they're reading something of yours, it's going to be fake and it's not going to be like how it really is. So there's that. Um, and then you could go all the way to the far, far end of this pool. Whereas like Lovecraft did Lovecraft wrote the supernatural in ways that are completely unexplainable. And when you're reading a book of something that's completely inexplainable, it's really hard to explain. So um, he'll say, um, I came upon some cyclopean ruins that's geometry were beyond anything man has ever understood. And there were angles of things that didn't make sense in the world of physics. And then um, the monster came up and the color was a color that no one has ever seen before. It was almost a purple, but it wasn't a purple. It was a color outside of the color spectrum. And you're like, what the fuck am I reading? Someone's like, I have pages and pages of description of things that cannot be described. Like, what the fuck is that, right? But it worked for Lovecraft. To me, it works whenever I read Lovecraft, but when I read someone who's kind of aping Lovecraft, I don't think it works. I just go, oh, they're Lovecrafting this bit. But if you could do it in a way that doesn't sound the way Lovecraft does it, I'm sure it would work. You just have to make sure you're not using the same verbiage um, because then it's pastiche if you're lucky um, and plagiarism if you're not. So anyway, I hope that answered your question, Matt, and anyone else who was leaning on that same kind of stuff. Um, I really, really love 
doing like these videos where someone asks me a question about a writing tip or something like that. Um, obviously, if I have some coffee in me, I could talk for a while. So um, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below and um, I will make another video about them and we'll just keep this train rolling until it falls off the fucking tracks, right? So um, recap on all the other stuff. Visions of Cody read along coming soon. P.O. Box 3054, um, Poetry Chapbook by me. Um, you could either get it by signing up at the $10 or higher tiers on my Patreon page, or you could just go over to my Etsy shop and pick this up. And then um, the free ebook. Again, if you want something to read that's amazing, because I tell you it is, short stories, poetry, for free, about 200 pages, go over to IHateMattWall.com and pick that up. And let me know if you did and tell me what you thought about it. That'd be awesome. And until next time, I will say so long.